I'd be willing to bet that if you are looking at this video on your computer and then you're looking at the same video on say a tablet, a phone, or maybe even something like a TV, that the colors would look completely different. And that's perfectly normal. The reason for that is because there are different types of display technologies out there. In addition to that, there might be hardware that goes together with that or software layer on top of that that actually modifies the color reproduction. And there's also another variable which is as simply as the age of the device. If you have an old TV, the colors of that TV will look very different than a newer TV just because of its age itself. Now, what can we do about this as photographers? Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it because people are going to continue using different devices to look at your work. Does it mean that you should be editing your images on something like a TV screen? No, absolutely not. Our task as photographers is to try to represent colors as accurately and consistently in images as possible, which means that we should be working with the display types that can help us achieve that. And if someone is viewing our images in a different device, that really for us should not mean that we should be editing our images differently. You might already have a display today. Maybe it's a display that came with your computer. Maybe it's something that you bought later on, or maybe it's already built into your laptop. How do you know that your display is good enough for your work? Well, there are many different ways to assess that. First of all, most displays that are really cheap, for example, in a hundred to $300 range, maybe even $500 range, they're going to be of a lower grade quality specifically designed for basic needs where color isn't important. For example, most color monitors today are designed for gaming needs and the colors in the games are really not important. Nobody's gonna look at, you know, the, the reproduction of colors in, in a specific game they're playing. However, if you're looking at a, some, at a higher grade monitor, for example, then that higher grade monitor is going to be designed specifically to be able to reproduce color more accurately. The difference between a professional grade and a consumer grade monitor is enormous in that regard because professional monitors are built specifically to be able to reproduce color more accurately than a consumer grade monitor. Well, how do you know if your monitor is professional grade or consumer grade? The way I look at it, whenever I look at purchasing a potential monitor, I look at its panel. And if you look at it, it will say something like TN panel. Well, TN panels, every display you, you see that says TN panel inside, that means it's a consumer grade panel. And that panel in particularly within that display is not designed for accurate color reproduction. In fact, it's going to even change over time. On the other hand, if you're looking at a professional monitor, like most of the monitors that Apple creates today are IPS panels. And these IPS panels have a very different display technology in them, which means over time, these IPS panels should be able to provide more accurate and consistent color output. What makes it hard is that even professional grade IPS screens might have different color reproduction between them. That may vary from model to model, from manufacturer to manufacturer, and sometimes even if you buy two exact same monitors, they might have slightly different color reproduction. This means that there might be different variances in play that all affect these colors. Our task is to make sure that those colors are as accurate as possible. How do we do that? Well, the good news is that there are specific devices that are created to address this particular need. If two monitors are outputting colors differently, you can actually buy a device which is going to measure the color output from each device and tell you how to fix it. Some software and hardware can do it automatically, while others require you to make adjustments to the screen to be able to get there. Now, when we look at IPS panels, for example, there's also a huge variation in price. You might be looking at a, uh, at a good monitor that might cost, let's say, $300 or $500 that you might get on sale, and then there are professional, true professional grade monitors that might be thousands of dollars. Now, does it mean that you should be getting those super high-end monitors? Well, it really becomes the question of how accurate you want your work to be. So you need to look into your budget, you need to look at your particular needs and assess exactly where you want to be. If you're just starting out, maybe a $300 or $500 IPS panel is going to be great for your needs. But if you're doing some very serious work and if you need 
to do say things like product photography where color representation is extremely important for the magazines and shops to be able to create those big ads for that type of work you might need to consider investing in a much higher quality display now when you're looking at a much higher quality display, the difference between those and a lower grade display is that some of them have the ability to calibrate within the hardware itself. That's something we call a lookup table. Now, I'm not, again, going to go into too much depth into this topic because it can be really advanced. But if you have a color measuring device that I referred to earlier, you can actually set it so that your computer can tell the monitor itself, look, this blue is not as blue as it should be, so darken it by this much. And that information gets stored in the monitor itself. So the higher grade monitors, they have this capability, LUT, lookup table, and the sole purpose of which is to do hardware calibration on the monitor itself. The nice benefit of that is that no matter what device you plug into that monitor, as long as you're not making any changes to the software output of the colors, and the, the colors are flowing from that device into your display, the color reproduction of that display is not going to change. Now let me tell you what I personally do to ensure that my work is more or less accurate. First of all, like I said, I use only IPS panels. So if you discover that your monitor is a TN panel, I would highly encourage you to get rid of that monitor or maybe use it for some other needs and get a higher grade monitor. Once you do that though, then the next question is, how do you calibrate it? And for that, we have different recommendations. We've actually written articles on the website about it. But my personal recommendation is to go with x uh, hardware. And x makes actually very good hardware. And what you do then, once you get that monitor, you put that device and let the software do the work. It will calibrate the screen for you. So, like I said, IPS panel is very important. That's what I personally use. And I don't recommend spending a lot of money on the monitor unless you know exactly what you're doing. Another important variable is viewing conditions. And this one can actually be more important than color calibration. Because if I'm editing an image in a very controlled environment and say that I'm doing that in an environment where there's no ambient light, no large windows in room, then my color calibration and monitor calibration is going to be dependent on that. Once I calibrate it, I should be ideally editing images in that same environment. So during the day, conditions are going to change. There's going to be more ambient light, light coming into the room. So if I'm editing images and I'm doing half of my editing in the morning and the other half at night where it's very dark, the brightness and the way that the images are being uh, reproduced by the monitor is going to vary. So for me, in order to be able to create more accurate work, I need to establish those conditions. If I calibrate during the day, it's ideal that I work on those images during the day. If I calibrate during the night, then it's ideal that I work at night. And the same goes hand in hand with multiple working environments. If you have a desktop, for example, that you always come back to and edit your images, and you have a traveling laptop where you do the work while traveling, you need to make sure that things like brightness levels are set up more or less consistently. If you're sitting with your laptop and editing in one place where there's so much ambient light that everything on your screen looks completely different and the brightness level is affected, you need to be very careful about those environments. I've had my case when I was traveling and I was working on an image, then I create the image, I post it on the website, then I come back and look at that exact same image on my desktop and everything looks different. It looks maybe darker or brighter or perhaps the colors look completely funky. In those situations, I need to make sure that whatever work I do and the environment that I'm in is more or less consistent with that original calibration. In addition to this, as you will see, whether you're working on your laptop or, or a desktop monitor, these things do change their color output and brightness levels over time. Things sometimes fade, the colors change over time. When they heat up especially, things can change too. So if you're calibrating your monitor, you do not want to turn the monitor on and start the calibration right away. So in this case, the best practice is to actually turn on the monitor and wait for about 30 minutes for it to warm up before you start the calibration process. So keep all of this in mind when you're looking and assessing your needs. I know I touched upon a bit more of advanced topics and perhaps it's not something that you want to look at at this time, but as you continue working, you might want to reassess the needs for more accurate color work later on. 
When choosing a monitor, another feature to consider is whether the screen itself is glossy or matte. And for example, this screen right here, this is an iMac 27 inch, as you can see from this angle, it's really reflective. And that means it's a glossy finish. Now, what that means is when I'm working and in a particular viewing condition, if I have a bright source of light behind me, for example, a window, and a lot of sunlight is coming through, I'm going to get all of that reflected off the screen into my eyes. And that obviously affects the way I edit images. So if you're evaluating a screen, you need to pay close attention to how the type of finish is going to potentially impact your working condition. If you have an environment where there's a lot of ambient light, whether that's the window that I just mentioned or maybe some other light, then you need to uh, potentially assess whether you need a glossy screen or a matte screen. For me personally, I prefer matte screens for that reason, but if you can control your viewing condition, maybe work at nights or potentially close off those windows so nothing is coming through, then a glossy screen works just fine. Now with glossy screens, manufacturers have been coming up with ways to make them not as reflective. For example, there's now new coding technologies applied to glossy screens, which make it a lot easier to look at them. And at the same time, you can boost the brightness of glossy screens so that the reflection isn't as bad. But you have to be very careful when you do that though. Whenever you adjust the brightness, you can potentially impact the way you edit images. For example, when you do the color calibration, it, this, the hardware itself will tell you how much brightness there should be in terms of whites and blacks. And you adjust that brightness on the monitor. Now, if you have to change your viewing conditions, if there's something coming in now in the room and the, the conditions are very bright and you adjust the brightness, you just completely changed the calibration of that screen. And that can have potential impact on your editing. So I would pay very close attention to that and make sure that if you do adjust the brightness that you, in those particular situations, you might need to actually redo the color calibration of the monitor itself. If you're shopping for a new monitor, you might be wondering what the ideal size is for your photo editing needs. Now, I personally use 24 and 27 inch monitors, but other people might have different preferences. So the question you might have is, what's the best monitor size for you? Now, back in the day, monitors used to be pretty small, especially when these LCD monitors started uh, taking over all the CRT monitors. We used to see these 15 inch screens, 17, 19 inch screens. Today, we don't really have those concerns with cost anymore and the production costs are much lower whether you're looking at a consumer grade or, or professional screen a lot of them have come down significantly in price so there's really no reason unless you have space limitations to go for anything lower than 24 inch in my opinion 24 inch is a sweet spot because the monitor is large enough for photo editing and there are so many great options out there from so many different manufacturers that you can choose a great monitor without breaking the bank. When it comes to screen resolution it's important to point out that resolution might not have a direct correlation with monitor size. For example this 27 inch iMac has a 5k screen but there are plenty of 27 inch monitors out there that have much less resolution. On the other hand, some smaller screens that we find, for example, on laptops could have as much resolution as the larger screens like this. For example, this Dell XPS 13 monitor that I have has a 13 inch screen and it has a 4K resolution. Now think about this, 4K here versus a 5K screen that's 27 inch. That's more than twice the size. And yet the pixels on the screen are so small that it definitely does impact the way I edit images. Because of its 4K screen, when I was sharpening images, for example, I did not see that I was over sharpening images until I looked at those same images on a low resolution screen. So keep all this in mind, whether you're shopping for a new laptop or perhaps a new monitor, their size and resolution are important for you to consider. Now, a lot of manufacturers today are pushing a lot of resolution. We see 4K screens, we see retina screens, and in the future, we'll start seeing 8K and even higher resolution screens. Does it mean that you need to upgrade every single time there's something new out there? Absolutely not. While these things look great on paper, as I've pointed out, they can potentially introduce problems not only to your editing, but also to your workflow. Now, a lot of photographers start out with a single monitor, and I did the same. 
but once I tried a dual monitor setup, I honestly couldn't go back. And the reason for this is because I can actually do two things simultaneously on two screens. So for example, if I use software like Lightroom, I can actually use the second screen as my viewing screen. And on the first one, I can perform the editing itself. But if you're planning to do the same, just make sure that the software that you're planning to use is going to be able to take advantage of that. So am I suggesting that you should have a dual monitor setup? Not necessarily, because with my setup, I had a lot of problems initially. When I had a single monitor, I thought, well, I'm just gonna buy exactly the same brand monitor and even exactly the same model of that monitor. So when the monitor arrived and I started calibrating the two screens, I realized that I could never actually achieve the same look. And the reason for that was because although the model was the same, the monitor was the same, apparently, well, age was different, and the new monitor that I just bought had a different revision. I didn't know anything about this, so when I started calibrating and I couldn't achieve that consistent look, I realized that the only way to address was th this particular problem was to get two brand new monitors. Now, that obviously meant that I had to spend more money. So if you're looking at your current setup and you think, well, I can just add another monitor to it, you might need to reassess that need. And my suggestion for proper dual monitor setup would be to buy two exact monitors at the same time. Now with age, you might realize that one monitor is going to have different problems compared to the second monitor, which is perfectly normal. That's why when you buy a hardware calibration tool, you need to redo your calibration periodically. Software sometimes can suggest doing it as often as every week, which I think personally is an overkill, but maybe something once a month or maybe once even a quarter if that's acceptable to you to be able to recalibrate that setup so that you're looking at more consistent colors over and over again. As you can see, color calibration is a very advanced topic because there's so many different things to worry about. And I do not want to get into all those details because that's way beyond the scope of this course. If you want to find out more information about color calibration and how to properly do it, we've actually written a bunch of articles at Photography Life that detail all of that. So what's the takeaway on everything we've talked about so far on monitors and calibration? First, you wanna make sure that the monitor is not a consumer grade monitor, that is actually an IPS panel that is not going to have problems with calibration. Second is the calibration itself. You want to make sure that you buy hardware that can actually work with that monitor and is compatible with that monitor, especially if it has a built-in lookup table so that you can calibrate that monitor and make it reproduce colors accurately. Third is the viewing condition. You wanna make sure that the viewing conditions that you're in are always consistent. If you don't do that, as we've said earlier, you're gonna run into all kinds of potential problems. And lastly, make sure that the resolution of your monitor does not negatively impact how your images are viewed on other displays. Now I just want to show you how easy it is to calibrate a screen. So right here in front of me, I have a device by x -Ride. it's called i1 Display Pro. And what it is is basically a very small measurement device, it's a hardware device. Uh, as I said earlier, the purpose of these things is to be able to actually look at the screen and measure the light output and see uh, and look at all the different colors to be able to see what needs to be changed. So right here, I've got the software running on the computer right now, and I'm going to go ahead and open it. And as soon as I flip it, as you can see, this is the actual optical part of it that is going to look at the screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply hang this on the screen, this is the top, and right, roughly right in the center of the screen. And as soon as I do that, let's make sure that it actually doesn't wobble right there, I am going to go ahead and start the process. Now, as I do this, the software is currently running, and as you can see, it's actually changing the screen. So what it's doing, it's, it's actually outputting different shades of whites, different shades of grays, and then eventually it's going to start assessing the colors. During this process, it's using this hardware piece right here in order to gather all that information and then do a comparison. And if it thinks that the reds are too red, it's going to change the blues and all these different colors. So this process can take about 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes it, it can be longer or shorter depending on the type of device you're using, the depending on the type of the monitor you're using, but it's a relatively quick and painless process that is going to potentially yield much better and much more accurate colors than what you have today on your monitor. 
All right, the device is now done measuring the colors and the software has already created a new monitor profile. Now the whole process for me downloading the software from x Software, installing it and measuring it maybe took at most 10 minutes, which makes it a very painless process. But the good news is now that everything is saved and if I now click before, you can see before and after the changes in that color output of the monitor. They're very subtle, but they're definitely there. So keep in mind that while color calibration might sound scary, as you can see, it's a very quick and easy process.